Uh, welcome to uh, everyone. Good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Molecular Device Webinar on Axon Conventional Electrophysiology. So my name is Jeffrey Tan, and I'm the Product Manager of Axon Conventional Electrophysiology Product and Market Devices, and I will be your host and one of the presenters today. So today we have two presentations. In the first presentation, I will present an update on Axon Electrophysiology product line. In the second presentation, it is an honor of having Michael Mohammadi from Endor Technologies, who will talk about optogenetics and electrophysiology. And I will take the chance right now to introduce Michael. So Michael earned his PhD in physiology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, working with Dr. Jan Min Tang where his work focused on using electrophysiology, calcium imaging and uncaging to study the whole and read of information by AMD receptors. He used a home-built DMD system for patent uncaging and his work brought him into the microscope world two years with Olympus and now two, two and a half years with Endo Technologies and focusing on optogenetics optophysiologies, and the hardware and the technology that drive this field. So during the, during the webinars, you can submit your question at any time. There's a Q&A button on the toolbar. First, press the Q&A button to expand and Q&A window, then type in the question and press the send button. So before we start today's presentation, I would like to, intro to introduce you our upcoming event Axon User Meeting and Neuroscience Meeting on November 11. So for those who are interested in this uh, in, in these uh, meetings, so please contact me directly. Now let's start the presentation of today. So the title of my presentation is Axon Electrophysiology Update. So the agenda, to the, my presentation is about 20 minutes. So the agendas of my presentation is that like, I will update some marketing activity update to you guys and have some old reviews and new update. So what is patch clam? So patch clam is a specialized electrophysiology technique to use it to measure the amounts of ion passing through a channel. So the signal is very small in terms of like pico ampere scale. And that's why we need a very sensitive measurement device, such as, for example, axon low noise amplified exopass 200B, and most of you know about this. So market device provides a high quality patch clamp instrument in this market. So we have been for 30 years. So this slide just show you the, all the, you know, our axon conventional electrophysiology family. So you all familiar with like p clamp software, have clamp pass for data acquisitions, clamp fit for data analysis. We have a digitizer. So we just launched this new Digidata 1550 on May of this year. And we have three types of, three models of amplifier, like ExoPass 200B and multi clamp 200B and ExoClamp 900A. And I will spend some time to talk about some Something is key features of some of them. Well, so I think this slide just show it data acquisition workflows as electrophysiology. We are interested the biological signals like, for example, currents and voltage. We have this amplifier to acquire this analog signal. Then we have the digitizers to convert the, the analog signal to digital to digital signal that fitted to the you know like software, like for example, PCAM 10 software for data uh, analysis and acquisitions. So why Axon's instruments? Because, because Axon instrument is a gold standard for electrophysiologists and because of high quality and also it's, it's highly reliable and we also have excellent customer service. So this slide just show you, we every year we have uh, a several uh, many customer support activities, such as we attend for the new, for the scientific conference, 
Uh, we have user meetings in Society for Neuroscience is coming up November at San Diego. We also attend to the biophysical meetings. We also attend the, uh, to the fans every other year. And also we have online webinars in which we will kind of like, we will give a tutorial for uh, PCLAM so that you can get the most out of the PCLAM uh, uh, software. We also, recently we also run the PCLAM software, uh, PCLAM workshop in uh, different universities, for example, Duke University and uh, UCSF and uh, UCLA. So in this slide, just show you that in the past, since of the 2009, we start the webinar series. So you basically you can uh, you can assess those uh, uh, previous webinar through this website. You can go to the moleculardevices.webis.com, then you can assess. We play all those uh, 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 previous webinar. And again, this is uh, I'm. We have the PCAM workshop. This is a one-day workshop that I will basically I will go to your site and have one-day uh, uh, presentation. Basically, I focus on uh, Clampex acquisition, acquisition and also uh, like Clampex and the Clampfish. It is a one-day event. So, if you, I mean, basically, if you would like to host the PCAM workshop in your universities, please contact me directly. And we also have a great loaner program to support, uh, I mean, the, um, all the electrophysiology classes, courses globally. For example, you guys may have heard about the Close, Cold Spring Harbor Marine Biology Lab, Woods Hole Mar Marine Bi Biology Lab. So we also uh, support a lot of the training course in, uh, in, uh, in uh, not just in North America, and also in Australia and UK in France, and we also have also uh, for some, you know, local universities too, like Stanford, University of Michigan, right? So, so please, again, if you would like to have axon loaner instrument for your electrophysiology training courses, please also contact me directly. <coughs> now, I want you uh, to review some uh, old, I mean, overview for you guys, like for example, I want to talk about the amplifier first and then we'll talk about the P clamp and the digitizer. So the first one I want to talk about is Exopass 200B and Exopass 200B is the lowest noise patch clamp amplifier and it is ideal, ideal amplifier for single channel recording like this, like Exopass 200B. Now, for the actual press to be, it's not only just for use for single channel recording, you can also use for wholesale voltage clamp recording and wholesale current clamp recording as well as extracellular, extracellular field potential recording. And also a lot of people use actual press to be for voltometry study, bilayer study, and even narrow pore study too. So what makes I mean, exopass to be is a lower noise because we integrate low noise technology in exopass to be, such as like capacitor feedback technologies, so that allow <coughs> allow the noise to go down to in open circuits. The noise can be like 0.13 picoampere root mean square. And as well as we also have the Hasty cooling too. Hasty cooling that can reduce the thermal noise to achieve a lower, the lowest noise. Now, in the right hand side, you can see, and I mean, you can see there's a noise spectrum from a Pesclam amplifier. In the market, there's a lot of the amplifier. I mean, it's basically, they use resistor feedback, resistor feedback as the te as the circuitry. If you look at this this blue line, now the y-axis is the noise level. And the excess is the, at the frequency levels. So you can see the resistive feedback, the lower noise compared to the capacitive feedback as shown in the as shown in the red line. You can see with the capacitive feedback, the noise will be reduced. And of course, with with also with the Hasty cooling in Exopass 200B, the noise is further reduced as shown you in the in the in the red lines. So that's why 
we have the capacitive feedback and also hasty cooling that give the exopestron to be is the lowest, lowest, uh, lowest noise uh, amplifier in the market. So, like I said, I mean, uh, uh, but in for the whole cell voltage clamp recording, then in, in exopestron to be we have the resistive feedback technology. This is a, a typical uh, circuitry for uh, voltage clamp recording, and this. In this uh, circuitry, we have the two feedback resistor, so that uh, for typically, uh, most people use the 500 mega ohm. That's for uh, for the uh, for default. So basically, you, you can record the current uh, up to uh, 20 narrow ampere. So if you need to record the current much larger, up to 200 narrow ampere, you can switch to a 50 mega ohm. Now the other one I want to go, talk about is the multi clamp 700B. The 700 multi clamp 700B is a computer controlled voltage clamp and current clamp amplifier. And from to my knowledge, it is an an ideal amplifier for wholesale voltage and current clamp recording. <coughs> so for example, it's good in voltage clamp. You can measure for the evolved posting of the current, and you can measure the evolved action potentials or spontaneous action potentials in under the current clamp mode. Again, also like exopest 20 B, ex multi clamp 70 B can also can be used for single channel recording, wholesale voltage clamp, current clamp, extracellular recording, and voltometry by layer and narrow post 32. So the one thing I like is because it's the computer control, we have the interfaces called multi-clamp uh, commander. So basically, because 70 b doesn't have knob and switch like 200 b so basically you have this interface to control all those, for example, the pipette offset, like, you know, capacitance compensations and series, series resistant compensations, all those can be done using this uh, uh, commander. And there's a lot of good features about 700GB. I'm not going to uh, talk all of them, but I will highlight some of them to you. For example, I would, I would mention about uh, the uh, this test days have the uh, two independent head stage and also have two accessory channel for additional field potential recording and we also have like automated mode switching between current clamp mode and voltage clamp mode, oscillation suppressions, and slow current injection. <clears throat> now in 70B um, head stage, it's called CV7B head stage. It contains two, basically it's a two circuitry in one head stage. So we have the current to voltage circuitry, that is for voltage clamp recording. We have we have voltage follow circuitry that is for current clamp recording. That's why we integrate it in one head stage so that it allows a rapid switch between the voltage clamp mode and the current clamp mode. Now I like 70 B because we can have it can it has it has two independent channels. They come with two head stage. So that you can perform with 70 B you can perform double patch for voltage clamp or double patch for current clamp or even though for one you can use for the voltage clamp, the other one for the current clamp. You can patch for two individual cells just like this. You connect the head state to the one cell, connect the another head state to the another cell. And of course you can also can study this kind of like synaptic you know transmission. You can have like for example the channel one, the head state one can patch to the Pisynaptic cell and the channel two has the two, and you know, patch to the postsynaptic cell, and you can study kind of the synaptic uh, circuitry or transmission. And on the top of that, I mean, a few of customers know notice that in actually, you you guys also have two aux auxiliary channels that allow you to record additional two field potential recording. Now at the back of the 70B, okay, you will see there's two inputs. It's called auxiliary inputs one and input two. So basically, these two these two channel you can connect it to another two head stage, but it's not CV7B. It's HS type. Okay, that we still 
we, we, we still offer these two hash, two hash states. So basically, these two hash states allow you to get the third and the fourth point of voltage recording. Basically, for example, in this scenario, so this two channel one and channel two is making two whole cell recording from these two cells. And you have you can connect these two auxiliary inputs, one to the cell body layer and one to the dendritic area. For example, you can then this area you can record the field EPSP, and the cell body layer you can record for the population spike. So, for 70B you can you can acquire up to four data points in one time. Like I said, 70B I like it because they have auto automated switch between current clamp and voltage clamp. For example, you can set up here. Now in this case, that when the current under the current clamp, I set up once the memory potential reach the first of like 40 millivolt, that it will switch to the voltage clamp. Just like, for example, I just show an example like this. Under the current clamp, once the uh, voltage, you know, reach to the 40 millivolt, then it will automatically will switch to the voltage clamp that allow you to recall for the current. <clears throat> and oscillation suppression is one of the good features because uh, what happened is that <clears throat> Uh, in the voltage clamp uh, measurement that we will compensate for the civil resistance. But sometimes what happens is that if we overcompensate for the civil resistance, so the oscillation will happen, or what we call is the ringing will happen. Those oscillation or ringing will cause the cell die. So in in uh, 7B Commander, if you check these boxes, what happens is that once the oscillation is detected, the Serious compensation, serious resistance compensation will be disabled, so that it's a kind of like uh, to prevent the cell die or the cell damage due to the oscillation. And slow current injection, I think, is also very uh, useful. Is that when you do the current clamp experiment, sometimes the membrane potential is not stable of driftings. That basically you can set up. You know, to set a slow current injection to maintain an excited, you know, voltage that you want. For example, in this case, I want to, in the current clamp mode, I want the current, the voltage will be maintained in minus 70 millivolt. So basically, slow current injection, current will be slowly injected to maintain to minus 70 millivolt. Now, the next one I want to talk to is exoclamp 900A. ExoClamp 900A is also is a computer controlled voltage clamp and current clamp amplifier. And it's ideal amplifier for two electro voltage clamp. For example, for the old side recording and also large muscle cell or large ganglion cell. And also have the two channels that's for the current clamp recording too. So we offer several modes of operation. For example, like I said, two electro voltage clamp and we have two channel for current clamp. We also carry, we offer like this continued current clamp, this continuous single electro voltage clamp, and high voltage current clamp. I mean, all those, you, you guys can refer to, uh, for the detail, you, you guys can refer to the manual. And again, the same as 700B, ExoClamp 900A also have a uh, interface, what we call is ExoClamp uh, Commander. So basically, use this commander, you can do the pipette offset, we can do the pipette cap, um, uh, uh, capacitor neutralizations and bridge balance. And the same as 70B, we also have oscillation suppressions and slow current injection in exoclam 900A2. Now I would like to go to, uh, now I want to talk about uh, uh, PCLAM. Okay, the PCLAM is a powerful electrophysiology software for data acquisition and, and analysis. And I like I have been using PCLAM for 10 years in the past, and it's a great software. It over a flexible protocol editor, and right now we support egg analog waveform output, and we also like a lot of customer like the membrane test between sweep that allow you to monitor the access resistance during the whole recording, and the online measurement is a great uh, features, and also we have the sequencing key that allow you to automation of the protocol loading. And at the top of that, we also have a good, very good analysis features, like for example, synaptic event detections, minis analysis, single channel analysis. I will use a 
few slides to highlight some of the features. The flexible particle editor, so in this particle editor, you can set up like, for example, step, RAM, also the train waveform. The one thing I like is also you can customize your command waveform. In the left-hand side, you see there's a typical IV you know, protocol. And actually, you can use the stimulus file that you can create your own or you can import your own waveform or create your own waveform. In this case, this is an action potential waveform, right? Basically, you can customize the waveform that you want. And this one I like is like I said, the online measurement. You can measure the speed, you can measure the area, or you can measure the slope. In this case, you can see we have the online statistic window come out at the same time. You can measure the fit for the pit amplitude or area and the curve. And and like I said, we also have the great um, analysis of uh, feature program like mini analysis. You can. Uh, it's a it's a great uh, great uh, uh, program to search for the event for you, and we also have a single channel analysis. For example, you can plot <coughs> to the amplitude histogram, um, uh, probability of channel open, and also the dual time histogram. Now, the last one I want to talk about is the Digitata 1550. This is our new latest generations of the digitizer just launched on May of this year. So basically, we, uh, we this is a, with the egg analog uh, input and output and digital uh, output too. So the, most people ask me about what's the difference between the 1550 and 1440. And basically, in 1550, we increased the sampling rate up to 500. And also, we increase the analog output from four to eight. <clears throat> and we found out that a lot of people don't use 16 analog input. That's why we cut down to eight analog input. That should be enough for almost 99% of the electrophysiologists. Now, the high sampling rates basically allow us to acquire more sample points per unit time. And this feature is basically requested by some of the customer, especially for those studies, single channel recording and narrow post studies. So basically you can have the, the, I mean, between the sample points, basically it's two microseconds, it's under 500 kilohertz. Basically you have more data point. And also we increase the analog output channel that allow us to create more command waveform so that we can pass for up to Excel, we can control the voltage and current injection. So I think this is very important for patching multiple cells in brain slide, for example, to study the neuronal network, uh, synaptic physiology. So 1550 now support to patch up to Excel uh, at one time. You can connect to Excel patch 200B or four multi clamp 700B. So I just give you examples like that. In this scenario, basically, uh, I connected to eight, you know, four multi-clamp 70B. Right now, we have egg channel. So you can look at the waveform. We can have egg waveform to control egg cell right now, right? So I think there's great uh, features for study, like I said, the neuronal network. So again, at the last slide, I would like to uh, make the commitment to all of you that molecular devices will committed to continue for the future product development, such as the software and the hardware. So I think I finished my uh, update for my product life for Exxon uh, Electrophysiology, and thank you so much. And if you have any question, please you know, enter the question in the Q&A. And now I would like to um, give the ball to Michael. Uh, the, the title on Michael's uh, presentation is Hardware Choice for Optogenetics, Considerations for Synchronized Light Patterning and Electrophysiology. So Michael, I'm going to hand the ball to you. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, then you can uh, sh share your desktop, right? And can you see it? Yep. All right. All right. Yours. All right. Thank you again, Jeffrey. That was a really nice presentation. And I appreciate Molecular Devices and Axon uh, for inviting me to have an opportunity to speak t to some of their users. Uh, so I'm with Android Technology. We have multiple divisions that range from 
uh, the product that I'm going to talk about today, which is in our active illumination portfolio. But we also produce uh, scientific cameras, such as SCMOS uh, and EMCCD. Uh, we specialize in spinning disc confocal, white light spinning disc confocal, as well as um, we own uh, Bitplane and Imaris. So this is a, a comprehensive solution of tools uh, net, uh, for a variety of neuroscience applications. Today I'm going to focus on uh, our DMD-based system, which is a digital mirror device for uh, integration with optogenetics. Uh, historically, people used a variety of techniques for stimulation. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these techniques. We're not going to go into them in detail. Uh, but oftentimes, you put a bipolar concentric electrode or some other sort of stimulating electrode into uh, your tissue or your cells, and you stimulate. Uh, in vivo experiments, use field stimulation or microinjection. Uh, and a variety of optical techniques, such as un uncaging uh, or photoconversion, um, were developed to have more precise control of stimulation parameters, both with electrophysiology and uh, with other types of me measurements, such as be uh, behavior. Um, so the, the field of optogenetics really emerged um, in the late 1990s. A variety of researchers working uh, independently uh, came about a a way to genetically express light-sensitive proteins into the into cells, into various regions within cells or networks of cells. Uh, and I really like this definition by uh, Jerome Miesenbach, which is one of the founders of uh, the, one of the first people that worked with optogenetics in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and he sums it up as a branch of biotechnology that uses a variety of genetic engineering and optics to uh, control the function and behavior of genetically targeted uh, cells with light, often in the intact animal. So I'd like to stress that this this field is highly diverse. Um, we're not going to go into, uh, we're not even going to touch upon the variety of techniques that people are using genetic expression with uh, optics to control some behavior or output. Um, but it, it's within neuroscience, it's very common to control ion channels. Uh, outside of neuroscience, people are genetically expressing plant proteins. Um, and other chromophores to control stuff as such as protein clustering and protein signaling. So it is a diverse tool set. Um, the little cartoon we see here just depicts the opsin that's been expressed, uh, light activating of that opsin, and it's important to note that many of these are very particular about the wavelength of light, which gives us some control over the stimulation protocols and how we can combine um, optogenetics with imaging, uh, and that light then activates some cellular signal. <clears throat> so um, to get right into the hardware components, the, the branch of optogenetics that we work with is microscopy-based. So we are not currently working in the in vivo field. So this usually involves an inverted or an upright microscope. And generally, uh, it's an upright microscope with a fixed stage for electrophysiology. Um, majority of our users are using uh, axon instrument devices, so, such as those listed here and those shown. Uh, they give very precise control over both the stimulation of your optogenetic probes as well as the, um, the electrophysiological recordings, uh, and especially the control and P-clamp for creating protocols is a very nice tool to trigger a variety of resources, such as uh, an LED light source, a DMD mirror device, as well as a camera. And uh, again, of course, also your electrophysiology equipment. What I'm really going to focus on for today is the, laser, is the uh, light source for optogenetics. And we're going to touch on a few of these. And then we're going to go into how uh, many of our users are using uh, a DMD-based system called the Mosaic 3 to do patterned or targeted illumination. So the DMD is essentially uh, a multi-mirror array. It's hundreds of thousands to a, a million little mirrors, similar to what's in a, uh, a projector or some other type of light projection device. Uh, and these mirrors are on the scale of 10 to 20 microns, and they can switch uh, individually very fast in the order of microseconds. So we take one of these DMDs and put it into a conjugate image plane of the microscope. Uh, and we illuminate that with some light source. And by illuminating different patterns of mirrors can create regions. So you can see on the right here, 
a cell in which three distinct rectangle regions were created and they were given light and simultaneous. So in, in the image in the above, you see uh, the on and off state of the mirrors. So the mirrors function just on a little hinge. Uh, and when they're in the on state, the light is projected down the light path of the microscope. And when they're in the off state, they go to what we call a, a light dump, just a light trap within the mosaic system so that it doesn't reflect through the light path. And again, the, the, the key here is that these mirrors uh, can switch incredibly fast on the order of microseconds. So um, it opens up a variety of possibilities in controlling things with very high precision in both the spatial and temporal domain uh, when it comes to electrophysiology. Um, so the key considerations for our discussion today will be the power density with the DMD, the ability to trigger components from Axon P-Clamp software, and the ability to integrate with an imaging system. And uh, I would just mention that we're going to be going over these relatively quickly, uh, and I'm happy to discuss any of these with you at length in the discussion or at the Society for Neuroscience. So traditional light sources for um, photo stimulation, photo activation, and now what people have been using for optogenetics include mercury arc lamps, uh, which tend to have a short bulb life. Um, they're a little bit labor intensive with uh, centering. They're very bright uh, and they're, they're cost effective up front, but the bulbs can be pricey, especially if the system's heavily used with the short bulb life. Uh, we also work with, and all, I should mention that we have many users that use all of these technologies. Um, so there, the implementation of one for your specific uh, application will depend on an open discussion with um, someone who's using these technologies to better understand exactly what method to stim what light source would be best for your requirements. Uh, so to move on, the metal halide, we have an Andor AMH, and there are um, probably a dozen commercial metal halide systems in the market. These have a longer bulb life and they're pre-centered and they tend to be bright, usually 150 plus watts and our AMH is 200 watts. Uh, again, a moderate cost with the replacement bulbs being the bulk of the long-term ownership. Uh, and those two are, are both, of course, white light sources and require some sort of filtering with excitation filters. We also often use lasers for integration with our DMD-based system, uh, but for the majority of our optogenetics customers, we are actually not using uh, many lasers. The power density required by the uh, mo majority of the opsins within uh, optogenetics and neuroscience are very light sensitive, so the use of a laser really isn't necessary. Uh, where, where we tend to integrate lasers in with the DMD is for customers who want to do um, some sort of FRAP, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, um, or uncaging, which uh, down in the UV range can require a, a very powerful laser. Um, and we are currently not working with femtosecond lasers, uh, but we're seeing uh, a little bit of an uptick in the optogenetics world uh, in, in this regard. The system that we're using most often uh, is the Lumen Dynamics x -Led, and uh, this system has four uh, individually controllable LEDs uh, and they can each be controlled via their own TTL. So this is a nice uh, system for integration with P-Clamp because you can uh, control each line as its own light source uh, and these LEDs turn on and off just like a light switch. Um, very long shelf life, uh, 20 to 30,000 hours or more, very uniform illumination and you can see from the image here they couple to the microscope or the uh, Mosaic 3 with the liquid light guide. So there are a variety, again, of LEDs in the market, and we do work with many manufacturers. And so, again, it's, it comes down to a choice of what exactly you need to get out of your imaging and electrophysiology requirements. So this is just to give you a little, under, a little bit of um, baseline of the required power density for many optogenetic probes. This is from a Nature Methods paper in 2012, and it shows really some of the more popular probes being used today. And uh, I, most people I work with have seen this figure, so I won't go into the details of it. Uh, but what we can see here in, uh, in I is uh, peak photocurrent with the individual probes, such as General Adoption 2 or VCHR1. And the power density required, uh, as measured by milliwatts per millimeter squared, 
to achieve that peak photo current or that peak um, current. And you can see in figure I, uh, most of these are peak if well before 10 milliwatts per millimeter squared. And the time to peak uh, as well is, is uh, quite diverse with these probes. Um, you should always look in, in, the, in the middle here. We see that there's also a very diverse um, peak activation wavelength. So um, channel rhodopsins are, tend to be activated around 460, 470 nanometers, where uh, such a, uh, other probes such as C1V1, which is created as a red-shifted probe, are up near 550 nanometers. And I, I've, I've said it, but I'll say it again. It's, it really comes down to the specific requirements of your individual experiments and your goals uh, as to what light source and, and as well what filter sets are considered for integration. And we are uh, we spend a lot of time with customers helping them design the optical inputs and optical paths within within their microscope. Uh, and just to hit the point home, the Mosaic 3 with the DMD, you can imagine a, a chip that has hundreds of thousands of mirrors that's being illuminated by a light source. You're, you're getting a loss of, of power because the fraction of power you're getting at any spot, it depends on what's coming off an individual mirror. But we've, we've done a lot of work in looking at power density, and uh, we can get uh, up to 50 or more milliwatt per millimeter squared with the L XLED at the common wavelengths for optogenetics. So uh, the Mosaic 3 delivers more than enough power uh, with LED, arc lamp, or metal halide for uh, optogenetic techniques. Uh, and, and what we see here are the two fields of illumination. We have a small field of illumination which fills our EMCCD uh, Ixon camera. That's a 512 by 512. And we have a large version which fills our um, scientific CMOS so both the Xyla, uh, five, the Xyla and the Neo with the 5.5 megapixel sensor, as well as the, uh, the new Xyla 4.2 as CMOS with the higher quantum efficiency. Uh, so here's where we're just going to talk really briefly about methods of triggering uh, these uh, on, on our Mosaic 3. And the device was really designed to have flexibility with uh, optophysiology, optogenetics, and uh, sequencing of light. So we have this. Um, we have number one just shows, uh, it's, it's called our output mode. This is a D sub, it's a 26 way high density D type connector. And uh, this gives us uh, two modes, an external trigger, which uh, activates a high input and would make the DMD the slave to your light source. It also has a DMD active mode, which is makes the DMD or the mosaic the, the master. So to, that would then trigger your light source. Uh, these can both be very precisely programmed within the peak lamp protocol, at a protocol window. Um, <clears throat> and also on this D sub, we have a 10 to 17 pin connector that does 8-bit, uh, and it addresses inputs to allow users once they've uploaded frames. So with this device, um, we've integrated four gigabytes of onboard memory. So uh, you can not only send patterns from your computer directly to the DMD, but you can load these patterns into the memory on the DMD head and sequence through them at very fast rates. And again, using P-Clamp, you could custom trigger individual frames uh, or individual patterns uh, very precisely and very fast, up to 5,000 frames per second. The other two connectors here, uh, I already actually mentioned what they do. Uh, number three is the external trigger mode, again, the active high input, and uh, number four is the, the mosaic is the master. So just to give you some ideas of the flexibility of triggering on the DMD head uh, and give you, hopefully give you some ideas how you can integrate that with your peak clamp and needs. Uh, so we have a few different modes. Uh, the next four slides, I'm just going to show you uh, some cells and show you the light. Move, um, it's a cartoon of light moving around the cells in the different modes. So here we see our IQ. Uh, this is our and or IQ software and our mosaic region sequencing. So if you select sequential, you can select uh, on, off duration, and a loop count. Uh, you can generate a sequence and then create time slots. And at each time slot, you're going to get uh, the regions that you identify, as well as the duration that you set within this loop. And um, again, this can all be triggered via our software or through PCLAMP software. So this is uh, the se sequential or the sequence. So you can see you could very precisely target uh, individual neurons within a network of, of cells. 
The next mode is cumulative, so uh, it's a little bit self-explanatory. Uh, so you can set up in the sequence window that you're going to do. Uh, if you look at sequence steps five and you go down the list, uh, we're going to start with one. Now we're going to do one and two, one and one through three, one through four, and one through five. Uh, and this would give you the ability to do um, maybe a, a IV curve with your optogenetic probe. So hopefully the video plays correctly. And I don't think it did. The, the idea there would have been, um, I believe, that you, you would have seen one cell and then two cells and then three cells and, and built up a region. I apologize for the mistake in the cartoon. So the Mosaic 3 customized sequence, this is exactly as it sounds. You can create any type of sequence or protocol you'd like uh, to meet your needs if you're looking at uh, integration at dendritic brand po branch points. This would give you the capability to um, create very customized patterns and switch through them uh, at high speeds. And then finally, we have our simultaneous mode, which uh, just gives you all of the regions of interest at once. So if you look back in the protocol, uh, in time slot one, we have forever regions one through five. Uh, you can designate imaging regions and then your on and off duration. Uh, so this is the R software to control the mosaic. Uh, it's important to note that you can also use this software, if you look at the bottom, uh, to upload patterns. So uh, you can upload 139 different patterns, and you could then trigger them through this, uh, this protocol window or through PClamp. And let's just get through this slide again. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to just go through two typical use cases of the Mosaic 3 DMD system with optogenetics. The first is what you would consider your traditional electrophysiology with optogenetic stimulation. On the left, we have you know, you know, a camera. This could be your um, DIC camera or a digital camera such as the and or um, Dyla, so our SCMOS. Uh, and this would integrate with our, our software. Uh, IQ or with Metamorph, as well as Axon P clamp. So the image from the camera is sent to the computer, and that image is then registered with the pixels within the mosaic. So we have a calibration procedure which aligns uh, pixels in the mosaic with pixels in the camera. So we have very tight precision of alignment in X and Y, and with, uh, to give you an idea of our, our optical precision at 100x objective, we have a diffraction limited spot. So we have the mosaic and the, um, the camera, which are both on the same image plane and are arranged in XY. Uh, we have the axon axo patch 200B uh, in the Digidata controlling your electrophysiology. And this is putting an output using a TTL to control the LED. And the LED, uh, in this case, is controlling the mosaic. So uh, <clears throat> in your protocol, you would see the LED uh, go on from a TTL output, uh, and then that would tell the mosaic to uh, go through wh whatever the pattern is that you loaded in and or the and or IQ software. <clears throat> so you could do a variety of different regions uh, and look at your optical stimulus with your electrophysiology response. So this is your traditional TTL sequencing. Think of this as the same thing you uh, are probably doing now with some type of field or stimulating electrode where you just set a duration and um, frequency of a TTL pulse and it triggers your lights or, or your uh, electrical stimulation. So in essence, we're doing the same thing. It's just with uh, optical stimulation. So an example of this, uh, this use would be, um, this is courtesy of the Yeckel Lab at NIEHS. Um, and this is, of course, a hippocampal slice. And they're looking... Uh, they're recording cells over here and pyramidal cells in uh, CA3. And stimulating uh, previously using field, uh, some type of field stimulation electrode in uh, the dentate gyrus and uh, looking at responses in the CA3 neuron. And what they've now done is they've expressed channel rhodopsin in the uh, DG neurons and they're photo stimulating so that they're looking at uh, uh, rather than looking at a multi, what they call uh, a multi-synaptic response here, uh, they're looking at a single peak response. So very tight precision. And you can imagine using the different stimulation uh, modes of the mosaic, you could do a variety of photo um, activation protocols, such as 
uh, you could do one cell or multiple cells um, or stimulate them in uh, synchronized manners to, cr to create an artificial uh, activation protocol. So um, this is the, the configuration used in, in their, their paper here, uh, Wang et al. Uh, and again, the, the, the point here being very precise control of light on individual neurons, uh, as well as dendrites. So we have people that look at, uh, look at the apical dendrites, and they can, uh, down to a single spine level, choose individual spines and photoactivate, uh, with often uncaging in that situation. The second use case uh, is going to be photo stimulation and imaging. So uh, here we have the camera being controlled by Andor IQ or Metamorph, uh, and we have P-clamp, which uh, is triggering the, the mosaic and as well as controlling the electrophysiology. Uh, and again, we have some sort of video monitor that is, uh, in this case, digital, which is co-registering the pixels of the DMD to the to the camera. So we have a uh, calibration. So in this situation, let's say we have a baseline imaging of two regions of interest uh, on the camera, uh, and we've decided that we're going to photostimulate uh, a cell in this region here under the green circle. Uh, we would then trigger our mosaic, our, our light source, to trigger the mosaic and have our stimulus activated uh, and continue to monitor the, say, calcium or voltage-sensitive dye in the, in the green boxes. And finally, we would... Uh, go back to uh, post-stimulus uh, acquisition, imaging acquisition, uh, to look at our response, so generally delta F over F. Uh, and in this situation, um, it's important to note that the and or cameras have uh, a variety of triggering modes as well. So uh, the, the ability to synchronize these components is very important, and all of our products have uh, very advanced level triggering and can integrate very nicely with, with P-clamp to control all aspects of uh, the experiment. Uh, and just an example of that work, this is from George Augustine's group uh, earlier this year. They're looking at um, YFP-tagged uh, channel rhodopsin in the molecular layer in inner neurons of the cerebellum, and these are uh, NNOS CHR2 YFP mice. And uh, in B here, we just see the inner neurons labeled y with the YFP. And in C, we see uh, just a little stimulus, stimulus uh, a light stimulus and a little action potential uh, in their electrophysiological recording. And what they're doing is uh, optogenetic mapping. So I had mentioned earlier some of the sequencing features of the Mosaic 3 that were integrated uh, for high-speed um, high sequencing and high-precision sequencing. They're starting to do some of that work, doing uh, different maps across different areas of um, the cerebellum and, and looking at uh, the voltage uh, with voltage sensitive dyes. So delta F over F is looking at change in fluorescence over baseline fluorescence. And you can see very precisely with their, uh, their stimulus here, which is blue light to activate the channel rhodopsin, uh, a, a change in the fluorescence. Uh, and they can measure this over time and over regions. And uh, they can create these maps across a variety of different areas within their um, th within the cerebellum. So both stimulus maps using the mosaic as well as imaging maps using uh, the, the camera and different region of interest. Um, so that, again, was just kind of a brief overview of the DMD technology and um, what we're, our, our strong focus on this technology for the field of optogenetics, especially with uh, electrophysiology. We've been working very closely with Jeffrey and Molecular Devices for the last couple of years, and I think it's a, a collaboration that's going to continue and improve. Uh, and it's because we realize that optogenetic is so important in neuroscience, um, and especially for electrophysiologists. And the, the key point here is it's very important to integrate these uh, with considerations for synchronization of both the targeted light delivery, the electrophysiological recording, the imaging and uh, the light sources. So um, with that being said, uh, I think that's the last slide I have. I would invite you uh, with, if, if you have advanced technical questions specific to uh, your, your experiments, I'm happy to, to answer them in the session after this. 
uh, or you can come and visit us at uh, SFN. We're going to be in booth number 612. Uh, Jeffrey and his team will be over in booth 2413. Uh, here's my contact info as well, and we're happy to uh, answer your questions, and thank you again for your time. All right, thank you, Michael. So thank you for uh, such good uh, um, presentation. So uh, uh, I I wish uh, the audience, if you have any question, you can enter the, uh, your question in the Q and A boxes. So I have one question for my side. Okay. So one question, one customer asked about uh, because he's using uh, old model, the Exopest 200A. Is Exopest 200A is also is a capacitor feedback? Secretary. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, so basically, in 200A, there's two types of the has the CV201 and CV202. So CV201 is uh, with a 500 mega ohm resistor, and CV202 is a is a 50 mega ohm. So basically, uh, they have uh, uh, with, uh, capacitor feedback there, right? So uh, I have a question for you, uh, uh, Michael. Yes. Hello. So I, uh, I think it's, uh, yes. as, in, as, as a neuroscientist, I, I, I think I, because I've done the brain slide preparation, I, I saw the slide is that you can you can so precisely to stimulate a single cell in the brain slide, right? How so? Can you tell me a little detail how so how does it work? How we can do a single cell stimulation in in one cell by by optogenetics by you know by a mosaic, right? Right. So um, to, to take a step back, optogenetics was uh, evolved as a technique to give more precise control of where you can put your light sensitive proteins so that you can control very specific cells. Uh, so to, to go back to the stimulating electrode example, previously people put a stimulating electrode and stimulate all sorts of cell types. Uh, with optogenetics, now they have maybe um, one cell type that they've expressed channel rhodopsin in, and now, uh, a lot of people are just taking a, a big spot of light and illuminating all of those cells at once, right? So rather than taking that one big spot of light and then illuminating all of the cells, we say, well, we can do a little bit better. We illuminate a mirror array, and looking at just one cell, we can draw right. a region around it with the mirror array, and only where that those mirrors are active will the light go. So, so we, we can create single or multiple cell regions of interest, and the DMD, the digital micromirror device in our device, will only target light to those specific regions. I think it's great. I think it's great, Tandy, because like just you mentioned, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, all the cell express channel rhodopsin, right? If they all expose it to the light, right? So it's hard to, you know, to stimulate to single cell. But now you're able to precisely to just by stimulate to one cell by optics, right? Right. Now the second question from you is that uh, do you have the uh, uh, the reference of the uh, uh, the, the uh, I mean you mentioned about the, the data that from uh, Dr. Wen right Dr. Wen's group right so can you have uh, can you send a, one of the custom about uh, I probably the paper the reference from from Dr. Wen's group yes um, if, yeah I, I I should have it I'm not sure why uh, the complete reference wasn't there I apologize. Uh, but my contact info is here. Happy to, if there's any requests um, for publications that uh, use the mosaic, or uh, actually just in general uh, publications within the field of optogenetics, I'm uh, amassing a large database as as it happens. So if anyone has specific papers they're looking for within this field, feel, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay. So all right. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I so I think uh, uh, so I think it's, uh, the time is up. Just uh, nine o'clock right now. So once again, uh, so I think uh, thank you for everyone to uh, attend to this webinar. I I will still uh, open for this uh, the time for about another uh, five minutes, so that if you have uh, any question that you can still can send it into the boxes. Okay, and the, at the end is that uh, I I want to. Uh, uh, to bring you to the, if you want to uh, uh, access to the webinar period webinar, so please go to the um, 
molecular.webex.com. That the left hand side, you can see the list of the event and select the getting the most of the PCAM program, and then you will then you will uh, uh, access to periods of recording. And then see you in our next webinar series. And also, of course, like Michael mentioned, that you're welcome to uh, come to our booth at the neuroscience meetings. So, and then see you there. Thank you again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>